taking nurturing care of our homes brings purity and well-being into our lives. In this video, Linda Thomas offers a splendid talk with lots of insights and tips based on her decades-long experience. For Linda, cleaning takes on a caring and nurturing aspect and is based on the premise that spaces also nourish us and, through purity on different levels, will bring us health. Linda had met Master Omra Mikhail Ivanov in 1977 and followed the teaching ever since. The Master once asked her where she lived and suggested she move to Dornach, where Rudolf Steiner had worked and lived. Indeed, at every meeting with the Master, he spoke to her about Steiner and once stated, I want you to study Rudolf Steiner well and soak in the teaching of the Brotherhood and then you will see. One thing led to another and Linda later created a cleaning company and published two books, both on spiritual dimensions of cleaning. One has been translated from the original German and published in English, Hungarian, Italian, Mandarin and simplified Chinese. For over two decades, Linda has been giving workshops and became a sought-after public speaker from Scandinavia to South Africa, from the United States of America to Taiwan, and from China to India. For our Circle of Light series on the theme Purity and Health, we also recommend you read Complete Works number 7 by the Master, titled The Mysteries of Yesod, Foundations of the Spiritual Life, published by Prosveta. So Linda, Thomas, thank you so much for being here. We're, we're so happy to have you and it's all yours. Thank you, Penny. And again, thank you very much for making this possible. It's really an honor and a great joy for me to share some of my experiences with you all. Cleaning is not the menial task so many people take it to be. And of course, it is a part of our practical, physical, daily routine, sometimes an annoying part. But learning to do it consciously with devotion and with love can support us in our highest strivings. I thought perhaps not everybody was here um, the last time that I introduced myself briefly. So I would like to just repeat my experience, the dream that I had with the master concerning cleaning, because that of course is one of the most important aspects of my work. And it happened about five years after I started my cleaning business. So I already had a lot of uh, experiences and practicing that I have been doing and uh, I was at the time also every morning at six o'clock cleaning all the sanitary areas in the Goethe Arnhem and a Thursday night I had this dream that the master came to me and he said it's about time now that I teach you how important the work is that you do and he took me to a room he opened the room. This was a room I had never seen before. It was very impressive, very high walls and colored walls with big paintings. And um, he stood on the threshold of this room and looked at the room. And it was like as if he was making a gesture of greeting to the room. And then he entered and started observing the room. And he really took in this whole room with his gaze. And after that, he started dusting and, and cleaning every object, every piece of furniture. He had a cloth that was folded and with the most um, harmonious and smooth rhythmic gestures, he cleaned every object and he really showed how important it was to handle these things with care. And then when he, when he dusted a surface, he said to me, when you remove the dust, for a small moment, there is a void, there is an emptiness, and nature does not tolerate a void. So he said, it's very important that you 
put the space that you have created at the disposal of the helping beings. You didn't say that I can fill it with, with whatever quality I thought was necessary. No, I had to put it at the disposal of the helping beings who were related or linked with the space or the people in the space because they knew what the people needed and the space needed. That is more than I could say of myself. So after we had finished the room, again, before he, he, he left the room, he turned around again, looked at the room, again, a gesture of greeting, and then gently closed the door behind him. I woke up on Friday morning with this dream and I was of course in a total state. I had the feeling that I wasn't really touching the ground and hurried off to my work going to clean 64 toilets and dying to practice what I have learned. And while I was busy cleaning, the person who was actually responsible for the cleaning of the Goethe Arnhem at the time came to me and told me that a few students were missing, they were ill. So uh, he asked me if I would mind doing something that wasn't actually part of my task that morning. And when I finished, I went to him and he took me to, uh, uh, to the area that I was supposed to clean. And the first door he opened to show me was the room in which I was taught the night before. And this room I had never seen before. And it was an office of the executive of the Goethe Arnhem at the time. Fortunately, I was able to leave for the Goethe Arnhem that evening, for, for, for the Bonfant that evening with my children, so I had time to process all that had just happened to me. I started cleaning professionally. I mentioned before that I did it because I wanted at the time to afford the Waldorf education for my children. And... Uh, their father said to me that it was a luxury and if I really wanted a private school for our children, I had to finance it myself. So I started a cleaning company and this company was unique at the time because it was I really uh, committed to cleaning only in an environmentally friendly way. I was the very first company that actually cleaned only with ecological cleaning products. I started cleaning a Waldorf school, that was my first contract. And then many other contracts came and I had a lot of work. And there was a certain time that I was not able to afford a babysitter. So I decided to work during the night. So when my children and my husband were fast asleep, I would go at midnight and start cleaning the schools until about five o'clock in the morning. Uh, when I had to, when I wanted to be home again in time for my children to wake up. So, of course, when you clean professionally, and I know that this is an international phenomenon, you are not necessarily treated with a lot of respect nor gratitude. People are very often indifferent. Sometimes they can be respectless. And what you find very often when you clean professionally is a lack of commitment. People don't seem to stick to the agreements that you have made. And I had to clean for 19 years. My children would be, yes, between kindergarten and the final school year of my son would be 19 years. So while I was working at night, at one point I had a bit of an identity crisis and I asked myself, how am I going to handle this for 19 years, working for other people, always removing foreign dirt, so to say, meeting indifference and uh, lack of respect. Yes, that was a real important question to me. But I had a second question. And of course, by now, I had experienced so many different areas and schools and classrooms and offices and homes that I asked myself, because the, the places were in such a different state of care and sometimes neglect even, that I wondered if the condition of a class, of a room or any, the state of a space will have an effect on what takes place in there or even on the people who live or work or learn there. And my third question was, of course, what can I do to help? 
how can I really support what needs to be done there? The most important question, of course, was how am I going to stay healthy? How am I going to continue this work in a way that would be positive to all? And one night while I was working in the school, uh, I heard a voice very distinctly telling me, if you cannot do what you love, you have to learn to love what you do. And of course, my very next question was, and how am I going to learn uh, loving to clean? And of course, I really lived with this question. And if one lives with a question, you also create space. And after a time, it's like something like a chalice that you prepare. And if you really work with that, then of course, something is going to be filled. That chalice is going to be filled. And with me, what helped me were memories that came back. And one of the memories was that my grandfather died in a car accident when I was about five. And uh, my grandmother came to stay with us on the farm. And, uh, you know, in South Africa at the time, we didn't clean. We always had people that helped us. So we never did anything in the house. And then my mother came to us and I was the fourth daughter of seven siblings. And my mother said that we four girls will now do something kind to our grandmother, that we will uh, make her bed for her. But because we've never made a bed, she first had to explain and she showed us in detail. The most important thing she said was the pillow. And uh, she took the pillow and she took it to the window and there standing at the window, she shook it very vigorously and then she patted it and she said to us, you have to do it in exactly the same way. Because she said, if you do it this way, then you can help all the tears and all the sadness that our grandmother has to fly away. And then we had to, to put the pillow back on the bed, smoothly, gently, and say a little prayer so that our grandmother could be comforted. And I tried to do this in many different ways. Something else that came back was the memory of one of the African women on our farm. Her hut that she and her family lived in wasn't far away from our house. And one morning I got up very early and um, I saw this woman standing in front of her hut. In her hand, she had a little broom that she had made herself with some little twigs and grasses. And she stood in front of the door and she looked out into the world, but in a special way. And then she turned around, faced the door of her hut and she bowed down as if she was greeting a king. There was such beauty in the gesture. And she started with very rhythmic and beautiful movements, sweeping the little path in front of her house, um, moving backwards in little steps and sweeping all the time until she read, reached the little border that she had, like a little veranda in front of, of the hat, hut. Then she got up again and she stood very straight, really very straight. And then purposefully she walked back to her hut. I found it fascinating. I was nine years old at the time. And the next morning I got up early again because I wanted to see if this is going to happen again. And he did. And every morning she did exactly the same thing. So once I went to her and I asked her, what it is that she was doing. And she said to me, I sweep the path in front of my house very carefully because only good spirits are allowed to walk on well-swept paths. And she said, the first human being to cross that path may bless the house. And she said, I bring a blessing to my house every morning. Now, the interesting thing is this experience says I had forgotten for between 25 and 30 years. And now that I lived with a question, how can I learn to love cleaning? These memories come back. And of course, 
everything started changing in the way that I worked. I learned that when you clean, you remove dirt. And when you clean with love and devotion, with total surrender to the task at hand, then cleaning becomes caring and it takes on a nurturing aspect. And whenever you start cleaning in this way, you don't only touch the physical. Of course, the atmosphere starts changing. Children very often experience this as light. They come into the room that had been cleaned and they would say, there's so much light in here. And uh, we, don't, we also don't just remove dirt, as I said, but we actually create space. We create space for new things to happen and changes to come about. And especially here, we must never forget the help at our disposal. We can always invite the invisible beings, the helping invisible beings to fill that spaces with what would be good for the situation or the house. So, of course, the different levels also include, apart from our home, it's our inner being. And here we all know the anecdote that the master used to tell us so often about the monk that uh, whenever he washed the dishes, he asked God to send him an angel to help him so that to wash his heart so that he could become pure. And that after a time he became enlightened. And then of course, we also clean our planet. And this is something that is so important. There's just so much to be said about cleaning in an ecological way. I will not go into detail. I, I would love us to have that um, awareness that everything that we put into the water affects our climate, affects our health, affects the water. We know everything about microplastics and things. And that's enough. I'm not going to say any more about that. When, I, when my company took over the cleaning of the entire Goethe Arnhem, when I was then employed as the, the head of the cleaning department, so to say, my condition was that I will only clean with ecological cleaning products. And that has remained since then. Uh, it has never gone back to anything chemical. So it is possible to change in many, many schools where I started cleaning and also cleaning with students, I changed this. The first thing I change is the, the products that we use when we clean. Please do not underestimate the contribution that we can make, not only with the cleaning products in our house, but we should also learn to read the labels of everything we use, what we put on our skin, what we wash our hair with. All of these things contrib contribute to the health of our planet. The whole practical side of cleaning to me is based on perception and self-awareness and self-perception, self-education. The outer perception or observation, that's quite clear to everybody. What we don't see, we don't clean. If you don't see the cobweb in the corner, you're not going to remove it. And self-awareness, and here too, we have an inner and an outer self-awareness, is the most essential part of cleaning, especially if you want to, to care for the spaces. And I mean, the master has, has dedicated more than, than one to tomb, you know, one book on, on man know thyself. So this is basically the essence, I think, in cleaning, we can learn so much about ourselves. Uh, we learn to consciously perceive our gestures and our movements, the way we use our hands, our attitude. And once we start doing this, uh, it's an incredibly exciting journey, journey of um, discovery that can begin. If you really start observing yourself and ask yourself, what are my gestures like when I clean? Do I fight dirt or do I transform it? Are my gestures harmonious and rhythmic? And we can, in every gesture that we make, whether we put our shoes on or do our cooking or washing up or cleaning, 
the gesture always expresses the inner attitude. So you can never separate the, the quality of the gesture from the attitude. And it also helps us to, to maintain order if we start really observing ourselves because so often this order starts because we do not put things back where they belong or we put them in a temporary parking spot or we leave things lying that we don't even need anymore, but that's a whole subject for itself. But just learning to observe our gestures, we can learn to put things back when we finished using them, when we cook or bake or whatever, we don't leave things lying around. And we also observe our inner part, uh, the inner attitude, you know, how do I react when I encounter dirt or disorder? And of course, I cannot even start cleaning if I haven't created order. Now, the in our house and the places that we work, we are surrounded by objects. And these objects mostly serve us because I believe that there's two reasons for having objects in our lives is because we love them, they give us joy, or because we need them. And all other objects basically can make space for things you love and that brings joy and harmony into your home. So the master has said so many things about handling objects and one of them is for instance, everything that passes through our hands become imbued with our emanation and transmit something of the quintessence of, our, of your being. When you give someone a gift, you are already communicating something of yourself by means of this object. If you live a disorderly life, the object is going to pass on the negative waves you have unknowingly introduced into it. And even if the object you are offering is magnificent and expensive, the person who receives it will not benefit from it. And there's another thought where the master asks whether we should distinguish or make a distinct distinction between sacred and profane objects. And here he talks about consecrating the objects. And this is so important because if we consecrate the object, of course, we're going to handle it in a totally different way. And it is also going to bring some very beautiful things into our homes. When I was participating in, in the, the Circle of Light meetings on nutrition, we were all always amazed at how often during that time, some of the thoughts of the day were connected with nutrition. Now, of course, cleaning as such is not really such a subject, you know, I've looked through so many lectures of the master and see how he actually talks about cleaning. I have not found many, but you have to take the other exercises that he gives you and apply them to what you do. And this is of course what I have been trying to do. And I must, I would like to read yesterday's thought of the day because I thought that was so wonderful. That was so very linked to the work that I try to do every day when I care for my home and the other places that I look after. Uh, science of unimaginable depth is contained in the symbol of the circle with a dot in the center. Why is the center of a circle always the merest dot, whereas the circumference, circumference can be infinite? The circumference represents matter, which absorbs all beings and all things, whereas the center symbolizes the spirit that radiates and projects outwardly. Instead of absorbing what it receives into itself, the spirit gives. This is why it is represented by a minute dot. And the circle is vast because it receives the riches of the spirit. You might say, but this means that the spirit loses everything. No, 
for it lives within the matter that has received its wealth. Nothing is lost to it. This law applies to all those who truly know how to give. It is the giver who benefits most because by giving, they live in all those who receive their gifts. Their spirit lives in them. Those who think that they have benefited from someone are in fact inhabited by the giver. It is the giver who manifests through them. I love this, this thought because when you cling really with, uh, with devotion and with love, you always impart part of your being. Part of your being goes into that object. You fill it with warmth and you fill it with love and this radiates back. So it's just something I find that that is so precious to always practice. And it's not only that that you can practice when you clean, but you really learn not to be judgmental because sometimes you can enter a space and it can look disastrous. And then you can't ask yourself, what is going on here? What kind of people are these? No, you ask yourself, what is missing? What do they need? Are they not healthy? Or is something wrong that it is like this? And so you learn tolerance when you enter spaces of people. You learn patience to do the work as it should be done. And you learn perseverance to carrying it right through till the very end. You also learn responsibility because nobody knows whether you do a good job except you. You know whether I have done the best I could. And the most important aspect that I think that cleaning taught me is humility. You know, you cannot be arrogant when you're on your knee in front of a toilet. That just doesn't go together. And I love the word in German, which is called demut. Humility is called demut. And the word demut comes from dinamut. And dinamut means the courage to serve. And you know, today there are so few people who really want to serve because they confuse it with being servile or being a servant, but that's not it. You serve, you serve with everything that you do with love. You serve humanity, you serve nature, you serve, you serve the spiritual world. So I think it would be so wonderful that if we could learn to just do the service to our to everything, with every little gesture that we do, to do it with uh, this humility and knowing that we are actually serving. Yes, we, we, we're building the future of our earth and, and of our families and everybody. There's so many things the cleaning can lead us back to ourselves because self-observation and self-education are crucial if we want to develop. It's impossible to, to develop without this. And of course, I don't know how many young mothers there are amongst us. I see only very few. But of course, if we want to be examples for our, for our children, we have to educate ourselves because there's no education without self-education. And I would like to just read a, a, a short uh, thought of Rudolf Steiner, because of course the children, especially the younger ones, learn through imitation. So it's so important that we try to be uh, examples worth imitating. So the task of the educator is to adjust the work taken from daily life so that it becomes suitable for the children's play activities. The whole point is to give young children the opportunity to imitate life in a simple and wholesome way. Of course, this whole thing of cleaning and education is very important to me, very close to my heart, because I work often with young mothers and I also work very often in schools where I really work with children from the first grade right until the biggest ones. 
we are people with heads and hearts and hands. So we think, we feel, and we do. And of course, we can discover that homemaking and cleaning can teach us, if we do these observations, what weakens and what strengthens our will. And um, we can go into detail, but I think that for the moment, I want to shorten because I would like us to have time for questions and perhaps these things can come back. It's very important to know that there's a lot of help available, but they wait for us to ask. They wait for us to invite them. And I'm talking about the invisible beings, the elemental beings, and even the departed, departed beings. Something else that has really supported me in my work was to live with this idea that our home is a living organism. Our farm is a living organism. The place that we work is a living organism. And just as the human being has a physical body, an etheric body, an astral body, and his ego, his, his spirit part, so does the house. And it's important to try to discover, and this we can also talk about if you want to, but that we learn to discover how do we experience the physical of the, the house. That is not difficult because it's in the resistance. It's, it's that which is matter and which opposes itself, so to say. But there's also these other areas in our house. And I think once we have accepted that our house is a living organism, there again, we treat it in a totally different way. And we know that plants, for instance, if you give them water, they will grow. If you give them water and loving care, they will thrive. And this is the same for our homes. And it's the same for our children. And it is the same for our relationships. Everything thrives if, if you handle it with awareness and loving care. There was a time that I asked somebody to help me in my home because I was very, very occupied. But I never allowed them to dust because when I dust my home, I actually believe that I take care of the soul of my house because every object I can then take into my hands and I can fill this object. I can, can you know, give this, this breath of my spirit to these objects. I can give it my warmth, my awareness, my love. And in this way, the soul of my house can remain healthy and strong. Because in moving from one object to another, the care we give, that it weaves threads that actually connect, connect the past to the future, and in this way maintains our house in a healthy state of being in the here and the now. So I think I'm going to stop now so that you can ask questions and we can always go into these things more deeply if you want that. Wonderful, Linda. Thank you um, uh, for anybody who wants to speak to raise your hand or use that little hand thing. Hi, everybody. Um, hi, Linda, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Enjoyed every bit of it. Um, I have a question about getting rid of things. You know, sometimes we have to declutter our homes and it's time to let things go. Do you have any advice about the proper way to do that? This can be a long one. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really important that we, you know, that we look at everything that surrounds us with interest, with really a lively interest and ask ourselves, does this add to my home or does it take some energy away from it? And, you know, people keep uh, objects out of a feeling of guilt, you know, out of a feeling of duty and things like that. And I believe that we should surround ourselves only with things that bring us joy or that really serve us. So that is my first suggestion. Look at the things and ask yourself, why do I keep them? 
Why do I keep them? And if you really speak to this object and look at it with, with as I said, with a lively interest, you'll get the answer back. And then you can, you know, you can really thank it and you can pass on. And I don't mean that you have to throw away things. So there's so many people in need today that are very willing to take things that are, have already been used. I know in Europe, we're always collecting for, for refugees, for people who are in need and they are happy to take it. And it's really important to be very honest to yourself because we always look for excuses to keep things. And you know, the master has spoken so much about the individuality and the personality. So when you speak to your object and you look at your object and you want, you're looking for an answer, look for an answer with your individuality and not with your personality. That personality is so crafty and in the end you'll stay with everything, you know? So I've seen this over and over and over again. You know that the house, as I said, is like the physical body. If you have a meal today, a wonderful meal, you know, it could be a beautiful buffet with the most delicious of desserts and everything. And then you say to yourself, that was so great. I'm never going to eliminate that. Well, guess what will happen? You will really have a health problem. Your house suffers often also because of a lack of elimination. The energies get blocked and they hold us back because through our etheric body, we are linked with every single thing that is in our home. So can you imagine where the forces go to if there's nothing in that object that gives something back to you? If I bring an object into my home, actually I commit to giving it the care that it needs. And if we do not give the care to the objects that they need, they will take from our energy so that they can be filled. And that is when things become very heavy and can take a lot of energy away from us. Linda, I really like the difference you gave between helping something grow and helping something thrive. Yes. And that things can only thrive if we bring our awareness and our care. And how I understand this is awareness is your soul. It's your spirit. So when we do something with awareness, it means we are okay with leaving some of the things, judgment or preoccupations and just be totally present. And how you said it, the difference between growing and thriving will stay with me like a stamp. Thank <laughs> you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. I mean, I knew I was in for a treat and you have confirmed to me you are you are an angel, so thank you so much. Um, that that was a, a treasure. Uh, I have a, a question, and I wonder what you feel about that. Uh, uh, all my life, I have been in hotel rooms, and most of the time, it was very good quality hotel rooms. Now, sometimes I would enter a room which was spotless, absolutely clean, and yet it felt sterile to me it felt soulless and i have entered places not necessarily hotel rooms other places where i would say well it was not exactly clean but somehow it felt uh, full of life and it felt i felt invited in there and i wonder what's your view on on this difference well if something feels sterile it has been cleaned to death to death that's what sterility is Something has been cleaned to death. So that is the exact opposite of caring for something. So if you care for something, then there's warmth and there's, there's life. If you clean it to death, it's sterile. And this you will feel, of course, and sometimes, especially in hotels, uh, you must know that these people clean under the most horrible circumstances. 
they usually work also with very strong project project the products so that it would just clean as good as it can and as fast as, as fast as it can you know sometimes people in that cleaning hotel rooms are given seven minutes for a whole room and a bathroom so they really they go through there like like um, robots you know they don't really think or feel they just have to have a pace and do everything so that they're not also going to be afterwards scolded because they forgot something but this is exactly what what i am trying to to say is that if you care if you do anything with care and awareness uh, then there will always be a certain amount of warmth and it's true you can go into a house and it could be slightly disordered but you know that's nothing that's part of life you know there's a certain kind of disorder that it just belongs to life. Of course, when it reaches an extreme, you also don't feel good anymore. So it's a question of balance. Beautiful, thank you very much, Linda. Thank you. Anyway, Linda, that was just wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I, could I just say something which the master told us uh, one, one day? Um, or advised us if we do have to stay in a hotel room and we're in a strange bed uh he advised us to put uh charcoals which i used to used to have a, a, a nice log fire so put charcoals on a saucer or a little plate under the bed and wet and wet them and that would absorb anything negative from whoever had been in that bed before and um in the days when we were traveling backwards and forwards a lot i used to travel around with this bag of charcoal and and i was forever hoping i wasn't going to leave this under the bed by mistake so that somebody would find this sort of soggy mess of charcoal no but seriously um he then told, told us to after three days to to either to bury the 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 wet charcoals or, or or get rid of them very securely that, that was one question the other one is um i i'm in the habit of always um burning incense at home um at least once a week i well how do you how do you feel about consecrating places with incense or other other ways well first of all i believe that you have to first clean properly uh, especially you should not consecrate or, or do incense in a place that has not been cleaned oh. and uh, then what is really important is the quality of the incense it has to be if possible church incense that you burn on a coal uh, the quality is absolutely important because oh. there are really elemental beings that live in odors and if you have some of these sweet smelling you know sometimes you get these these really sweet sometimes even chemically perfumed or you've got some heavy perfumes like patchouli and things like that they can be very nosive because they are on a very low astral level yeah. so you can actually invite negative beings into your home by using incense in the wrong way I think it's really important that you also have this total awareness of, of devotion and, and, and what do you consecrate it for and to, you know, not slip away, leave a door open, because then anything can come in. That's what the master said. You know, we always have to, to say only these beings are, are to enter. We can't just walk through a place and say, all you invisible beings come and fill my house. But then it's like an open door party. <laughs> <laughs> and you can really have some bad surprises but um incense is fine and what i do if i travel and i am in an in a place that i have to stay in the first thing i do is i really open windows mm -hmm. and i always have with me a little bottle of water in a spray bottle i have a little lovely little spray bottle and then I can I work with the angels of the elements and I work with the elemental beings and I work with them in a very specific way. You know, the master told us that we have got cleaning and washing and purifying and sanctifying. So 
we can work with the elements and, and do this. We can sanctify a room uh, by burning a candle and being aware of how that element works. And that this is one of the things that I've repeated when I said that there's help at our disposal and we must just make use of it. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Linda. It was a great presentation. You said something that really went into my heart when you talked about when you go and clean people's house and you take away the judgment aspect of it. Even though I'm not cleaning people's house, you know, you tend to kind of be judgmental when you go to people's house. And uh, your question was, what's missing? And that really went into my heart. So then you remove the judgment. And I think it's something that it's going to help me going forward in, instead of being judgmental, thinking about what's missing there that put this situation into what seems to me, not to them, as a chaotic uh, you know, situation. Thanks so much for that. I really appreciate it. I don't know if you want to add more to that. That would be great. You replace judgment with compassion. Mm -hmm. Because I think generally people, even youths, you know, when their rooms look like terrible, you know, and, and you say, the mother says, why does your room lo look like this? Well, it's my room and I like it and I feel good. And yet if you then go in there and you really make it tidy and beautiful, they are so touched and they're so moved and they say, oh, mommy, now it really feels good again. And, you know, my son once, his room was really in a state. And I said to him, I think, you know, that it's time to do something about your room. And he says, mommy, it's my room. And I said to him, it's your room, but it's my house. And if one organ in the house becomes contaminated, the whole organism can fall sick. So I would like you to take responsible for that organ of the house, which is your room. So he says, well, now I have no time. I'm going to visit my friend. So he runs away, disappears, comes back two hours later, goes straight into his room and cleans and cleans and makes order and does everything. And I said, well, what happened in two hours, you know, that, that now you needed to clean? And you know what he said? He said, mommy, I went to visit my friend and I never want my room to get in a state like he is. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Thank you. So I, I think sometimes that. we have to just compare. We, they have to have the possibility to compare. That's why it's so important that we keep our houses in such a, a you know, in such a, a, a condition that it can always inspire and that they can always have this possibility of comparing because it's terrible when when parents sometimes give up you know when when they have teenagers and they say okay well it's your mess i'll leave you to it we should never give up on a child never because if we give up they despair even if they don't show it so it's always good to find a a, a reason or a way i always say if my son's room was really bad and he, he didn't want me to help him, I could feel when he was overwhelmed. And then I would prepare myself. I would speak to his guardian angel and I would ask his guardian angel to show me when and in which way I can suggest that we do something about the room. And then, you know, I would sort of just casually at lunchtime say to him, you know, tomorrow I have nothing to do. So if you pick up a little bit today, I'll clean your room for you tomorrow. Or I will say, if you want to, we can do it together. And when I did it in that way, they never said no, thank you. They were always very happy to accept my help. So it's really this thing of, of learning to feel compassion rather than judgment. Thank you so much. I have a question for Linda. I'm wondering what we should do when um, there's a lot of catch up work to do and we want to do this work, but we just don't know where to begin. And uh, we're not in the place yet to um, do rhythmical cleaning on a regular basis, but we have a lot of catch up work to do. We've been in the same place for 31 years. There's been changes. What should we do? There's been accumulations also. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, what I would suggest 
is uh, if I ask you straight out, do you know which room in the house needs it most? That's a good question. That's the one you should ask yourself. Mm -hmm. which, which room needs it most? And you know, then what I would do is I would go to that room and I would stand in the threshold as I was taught in my dream and I would observe the room and I would ask myself or I would ask the room, what do you need? What do you need from me so that you can actually fulfill your task? Because the rooms, our houses, they're there to serve us. They're there to fulfill a task. They're there for human beings. And they want to fulfill that task, but sometimes we hinder them in doing that. So then when you have that place, that room, then you ask yourself, what in this room disturbs me most? Uh -huh. And, you know, I can just give you a little example. Um, one mother asked me once, and she said, oh, I know exactly which room it is. I don't even like to go in there. So I said, well, that's the room that you have to start with. Because the worst place is the one that, excuse me, drains most of your energy. Because, you know, once you start cleaning really purposefully, you will most probably continue and not feel fatigued. But what is the most fatiguing is to have a mountain in front of you and not knowing where to start. So, you know, you just don't start because you don't know where and you're so overwhelmed. So you start with this one room and then you start with that specific thing that disturbs you most. And in this case, this woman said she had a room that was basically a child's room, unfortunately, but she also did some sewing and mending in this room because that's where she could put up a table to do so. And then she had a sewing basket and she knew that in that sewing basket was a little favorite dress of her little girl that she had promised to fix because it had been torn. And then she called me afterwards. She said, I immediately went home and I fixed the little dress and then unfortunately it was too small. <laughs> yeah, it's sad, it's sad, you know, because she had waited so long. So actually it was a double disappointment for the little girl. Finally, her mother fixed it and now it's too small. But you see, if we can find what disturbs us most and we can do that thing that we have been putting off for ages, that is going to release energy. It's going to be really something that's going to free up energy and then you start and you know you start you stand by the door you look at the room and you decide i'm going to go left or right and then you go along the periphery and you clean from the top down you pick up your dust you do whatever you need to do and then you you know when you've done the whole periphery then you can start in the middle but why the, you go along the periphery because if you have uh, if you are called away or you have to stop, then you know exactly where you've been. And if you can see what you've done, that's encouragement. But you know, often people clean like a chicken eats, you know, they go pick, 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 pick. So they run from the one place to the other, crisscross across the room, spend a lot of energy and a lot of time is wasted. And if you clean systematically and orderly, then you can see your progress as you go. And every bit of progress that you see encourages you for the next step. Now, one of the most important things when you really have backlog, don't ever tell yourself, I'm going to, tomorrow I'm going to start and I'm going to finish that room. Because that you immediately actually programming yourself for another failure. And this is what is so terrible about having a backlog is that you keep on feeling that you're failing. So you should really say, I'm going to start and I will do every day a little bit of something, even if it's just 10 minutes. And then you always plan ahead. And I'll tell you just a little anecdote to, to, to uh, uh, explain that is, I was in America and I was giving a workshop and there was a young man was always following me and asking me a lot of questions. 
So six weeks later, I got an email and this young man said, do you remember me? I asked you so many questions. He said, I'm 35 years old. I am a single dad with three boys. I have a full-time job. The boys were between the ages of nine and 12. And he said, I always thought that I did the necessary, but when I went home after the workshop, I realized in which dirt and disorder we lived. And he said he was so shocked that he decided that from that very moment on, he's going to start doing something every day. And even if it's only for 10 minutes, and he said he immediately started and he continued every single day. And he said, after a few days, the boys offered to help him. And then he wrote to me and he said to me, Yesterday, the four of us gave our, um, you know, our home the final touch. The whole house is orderly and it's cleaned and we've got flowers everywhere. <laughs> and he said, and I baked us something special for Sunday, Sunday breakfast to celebrate. And he said at the table, the 12 year old boy said to him, I don't know how to thank you daddy, because now we have finally got a home again. And that's the difference between a house and a home. Mm -hmm. It's the care that we put into it. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. You have any recommendations how to clean negative energy from a home? That, that is really a little bit a question that you have to, again, you know, live with questions and tune into your home that you try to find on which level is this ne negative energy. Because is it in the air? Is it on the walls? Is it in the carpet? Is it a piece of furniture? You know, there can be so many different ways. So it's important to try to really feel what it is. If you know what it is, you know, if a person had died there or if a person, people lived there before, they did a lot of fighting. These are all different levels. So we have to try to find out on which level do we have to clean. Sometimes it really is important to wash down all the walls and all the ceilings and really wipe down every single part of that house. And sometimes if it's not too heavy, it helps just by, you know, that's something that works really beautifully is if you have a, a, a spray bottle with water and you can add a few drops of essence into the water and then you can move through the space you know, using this lemniscate, um, uh, lemniscate movement while you spray the water into the air, work with the angels of, of air, with, with all the angels you can work to help, to ask you to, to disperse that energy. When you spray water in the air, that always changes the, everything, you know, it becomes ionized and there's something that changes in the air. It is also because when two elements penetrate each other, new elemental beings come about so that they can help to clarify the space. So when the sylphs and the ondines mix, you know, when the water is sprayed into the air, this is why we love being where waterfalls are, where there's all this water spray in the air, because that's, uh, that's totally new and fresh elemental beings that are there and they can help us to, to also clear the, the space. Then of course, you can help with incense, but first you have to clean. Uh, it's you know I, it's a, a quite a lengthy thing to do because you have to try to find out what it is. If this person knows what the problem is, then she may write me an email. You can write me an email, explain, what the situation is, and I can try to advise you from there, if you would like that. 
because you know it's really different if somebody had died in there or, or if there was a suicide or whatever there's so many different things that can leave a negative energy in a house so one has to to know i have to know a little bit more i don't have a question i i want to say that thank you very much it was very very interesting and uh, blesses for all of you love you <laughs> bye I have thank to leave you. okay bye thank you. bye bye thank you thank you very much thank, thank you. you for one thing when somebody comes to help me clean I have had uh, uh, periodic cleaning help when they leave and I work with them I feel so happy I always say that to my husband I just feel so happy uh, so I know I mean, Linda, you're giving all the reasons why that would be, which is wonderful. The other thing about objects, I heard recently in a, a, a lecture, I listened to a talk by the master. He said very emphatically, get rid of your old treasures. And um, I have jewelry from my grandmother. I have I have a number of treasures around here. And it's it's difficult. It's difficult, but I know most of them have to go. They do. So that's a process for me. Thanks. Yeah, but you know, it's uh, it's something that one can thank them and say goodbye, and somebody else might be very, very happy to receive them. I just wanted to share something which is a little bit like nearly the other side of the story. Um, for many years in my life, I, I used to spend 10 to 12 nights every month in different hotel rooms. And I used to, when I would leave the, the room, I would, I would see these wonderful women, mostly women, uh, cleaning the rooms. And uh, I always had just so, so much love for, for them. And I was looking at the doors, you know, very often they, they leave the door open to the, the rooms which have been emptied before. And I would see such a mess in there. I mean, just, I mean, I don't know, some, some, some rooms look like, like, like battlefields. And I developed uh, uh, over the years a feeling that uh, when, when a, a woman like that, a clean woman would just enter my room, I would not be able to clean the room for her, obviously. But um, I, I, I made a point in that the very first look she would have of the room where I was would be a pleasant one. And I know Julie a few times told me, what are you doing? Because I was always like, like, like putting the bed together, you know? And, and I had a feeling that I was giving something back to these wonderful women just by offering them a, a harmonious first glance. And I wonder if you have something to say about, the, about that, Linda. Well, I think that's part of this exercise of, of awareness that I spoke about. The master teaches us that we leave traces behind, and it's up to us which traces we leave behind, even in a hotel room. One of the most important things that I do when I leave a hotel room is I make very sure that the toilet is clean and that I leave no hairs behind. This is something that is really essential that I always teach all the children wherever I go. I said the first step in towards cleaning environmentally or, or doing something for the environment is never to wash your hair down the drain. So you should always have little strainers and when you've combed your hair or washed your hair, always look back and see if you've got a hair somewhere, pick it up and throw it into the rubbish. Don't throw it in the toilet and wash it away because in the purification systems, these hairs can cause terrible blockages and to, in, to, to free them of the blockages, they use very, very strong acids. So it's just so important to not leave hair behind in your own home, but also in hotels. And I know when I've been, I went to clean so many different places, so many people and uh, it really is different you know you feel if somebody truly respects your work if they try to leave it in a way that is 
pleasant when you come in. If your first uh, impression when you come in, you say, oh, nice, now I can start my work. But if you think, oh, God, now I first have to do this and that and that and that and look at this. Because I've seen that, how people can, they trash rooms sometimes, they trash hotel rooms. You think that they do it, uh, you know, on purpose. So it's up to us, the way, the traces we leave behind us. That's very important. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Linda, it is so inspiring to hear you share. I'm in the process of reading your book now. I'm almost finished and I love it. I just love it. My question is, in um, when we think about the beings that can be in our home, do we have the, uh, let's say, ascended masters that might we might resonate or think about at times, might they be there like Archangel Michael or Saint Germain or some of our favorite teachers, some of our favorite poets, do the elementals, um, when we love nature, do they come into the house with us? Do they love being there too? Who are some of these beings that choose to live in our home? And are there any prayers to call on even more beings to inhabit every room in our home. Thank you. I think the most important thing is to know that we invite them into our home through our prayers, through our meditations, but also through our actions. You know, if you, if you meditate and you invite all these beings in, and then you, you treat your house in a loveless way, you know, you and you allow neglect to enter, or you do something that's not loving. It's like basically like the master says to us, you know, we invite the beings, the beings that will come and live within us. They are the ones that are going to resonate with what we are able to offer. You know, so that's why he says, you know, God isn't going to come into a temple that stinks. Uh, it's it's really the work that we do through our thinking, feeling, and willing, but also, of course, through the way, the things that we do physically. Every gesture attracts beings. And, you know, every kind of work that we do sometimes even creates new beings, as I've said. So basically, the beings that we want to have in our space are the ones that we invite. And I don't think the quantity is important. You know, you can you you don't need to have a thousand beings in your room to in your house to be happy. But the ones that will come there through your awareness, and they will be the ones that will support you. If you read a poem of a poet that you really love, you invite him to come. And in reading beautiful things, you know passages from the master's books or so on, you even can invite the departed beings that you were linked to because they love that. They love us to speak with them and to read to them while they are before they incarnate again. May I uh, add a question to that? When we visit friends, uh, we have uh, one set of friends who have... Um, in the past, they've had a huge dog in their home um, and other friends who have cats. And I notice, I just wonder if certain beings come into the home and surround themselves around the animals and some of those beings may, we may not want in our homes. So if we walk into somebody, uh, somebody else's home and we stay there for dinner and we stay there for hours and we're around these animals for that length of time, are there beings around animals that typically are maybe not appropriate for being around human beings? That depends on the way that animals are kept. Because now this, of course, I don't remember having read anything about that from the master, but Rudolf Steiner speaks about that quite clearly, that if you have animals that you love, that you care for, that you take care of, they actually have salamanders around them. And, you know, that's the thing that it, it's, you know, nothing is good or bad. 
It's the way that we treat them that they're going to be either good or bad. Now, if you don't like dogs particularly, then you don't have a dog. But if your friends have dogs and they love their dogs and they take care of them in a nice way, then usually these animals will have positive, uh, positive beings around them. And of course, if these are animals that aren't treated nicely or treated cruelly, there will be different kinds of animals around them, um, uh, beings around them. But you know, it, the, the elemental beings as such, the master said they are neutral, but it's the tasks that we give them. They can work for the good or they can work for the bad. That's why it's so important to always invite the helping beings because not every invisible being is positive. So thank you so much, Linda, for this, uh, this wonderful opportunity to share your experiences with us here. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, uh, the cleaning and the purification is the centerpiece for all the spiritual work. There's a system work. of divination that uh, is still from divine inspiration from uh, uh, ancient China. It's called the Feng Shui, which can play a role uh, into the different energies in the house, areas of the house. Um, I remember in Bucharest, I had like a really tiny room. I had no control over, over what was going on in the whole apartment. But I put the diagram with the squares on that tiny room, and there was an area of the master, there was an area of the spirituality, there was an area of the study. And I tried to put at least a, a picture that would uh, kind of fill that area of the room uh, uh, so that uh, the energy would, uh, would help uh, that activity in my life um, overall. And I'm trying here also in the, uh, in the house I, um, I own now here. Uh, so thank you again for, uh, for this wonderful opportunity and uh, um, please continue to, to help us with uh, advices here. It's, it's, uh, it's very much welcome. I'd like to say something about Feng Shui. Sure. It's really important, of course, that we sense what the spaces are, uh, actually need, what our room needs. And it's, it's often very, very good to live with this question rather than to impose something from the outside. I had a very interesting experience. You know, I've been to China, I've traveled there, and there was this one man who comes from a dynasty of, of uh, space clearers, or actually they call that, you know, they, they, um, they release houses from spirits, from bad spirits and things like that. And this is an interesting profession because it's always passed from father to grand, from grandfather to grandson. It always has to skip a generation. So it's never passed on from father to son. And this man told me that he went with his grandfather to a very wealthy Chinese person who had a, a, a very spectacular wine cellar but he said there was a bad spirit in his wine cellar and there was always bottles breaking and the servants were so superstitious and scared that they refused to go to the cellar so if the the nobleman wanted to have a glass of wine he had to fetch the wine himself and of course he didn't like this very much so he had this person come so the, the grandfather went in there and he came out and he put a big sign on the door and the door and the sign said, here lives, whatever the name is, the master, no, the caretaker of the shelf of the cellar. And then, of course, the house owner said, but is that going to be enough now? Is the, uh, am I going to be able to have peace in the house? And he said, yes, because you don't have a bad spirit in your cellar. He was simply bored. He, he, you didn't give him anything to do. But now I have charged him with the responsibility of taking care of the cellar. And nobody will ever do anything wrong in the cellar again. So you see, it's so important. It always comes down to what we do with our strength of, of spirit, you know, that is stronger than any object. It's like the talisman, the master says, the talisman is only as good as the way that you nourish it. And it's the same for our homes. Don't underestimate the power of our spirits and the helping beings if we work with them really in a confident way. 
Oh, okay. Well, well. First of all, Linda, I, I'm unbelievably grateful because um, although met, you've put a, a new light onto many things, and although it, it's possible that we we may know some of them, it still reminds us. I don't know. I need to be reminded all the time about the simplest things, about the eating and the cleaning, and I need it. And so I just thank you very much for doing that. Now, I was just a little note. I put I put a chat uh, saying um, when we travelled with the master, um, and I remember um, that we were in Egypt, and he showed us our the hotels in in uh, Egypt were not remarkably clean I might say and uh, and, and uh, he showed us as we left he showed us his room and it was impeccable the bed was made and uh, it was in, in impeccable order and he, he just showed us this so ever since then of course we 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 did exactly the same thing um, um, always tidying up our room and cleaning as you said cleaning the toilet making sure there wasn't hair and uh, and now I what I, I go further because if I go into um, a hotel room I always think about the people who come afterwards. So I really spend some time before I leave in, in blessing it. I make the sign of the pentagram on the mirrors and the doors and uh, on the bed. And um, 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 so and so that it's 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 nice for anybody who goes into it. Hopefully after the cleaner, then the next person, the next person. And actually, a, a, a cleaner, um, I was just leaving with my little suitcase, and Tina followed me, and she said, well, thank you so much. I, I really love, love to go into your room. And it's a really, really nice. And so that was just so beautiful. And another time, um, I'd left a copy of uh, one of the master's books by mistake. I hadn't meant to. It was left by mistake on the bedside and she ran after me and she said oh madam please can I keep this it's mm. so wonderful so I just thought wherever I don't know wherever we go and I'm reminding myself because I don't know life just trundles on in such a haphazard and way that we, I forget so I'm reminding myself and thanking you very much for giving me that opportunity to to do yeah. that thank you yeah. <laughs> thank you I'll be brief. Linda, you mentioned about never putting the hair in the sink or in the toilet. And then Ovidio said that he remembered the practice of keeping the hair in the nail. So the nails. So um, I remember when I came to the Brotherhood, a sister had told me that if I collect my hair that falls on the floor or in the sink and put them in an envelope and when I clip my nails, put those in an envelope and every once in a while, burn it. And she was saying that it was a practice, maybe the master had mentioned it once to somebody, um, because our hair and our nails have the recording of our entire being. And if we uh, burn them, consecrate, consecrating them, and asking for us to be transformed and become better and pure. So that's just to complement the story on the hair and the nail. If, if you want to have a, an extra practice in your life, collect them in an envelope and do something good with it. That's it. That's fine. That's a nice, I heard exactly the same thing, Carmen. I also heard that it's an excellent fertilizer. So I have a garden and I put my hair and my, my uh, nails, I bury them in the garden and then they will become fertilizer. And actually I have, I know somebody who does the same thing in her house, in her potted plants. And she cuts them very small and digs them right into the earth. And she says her plants really thrive. It's excellent fertilizer. So, you know, there's different ways of going about things. I always think to give things back to the earth if we can, it's a good thing because the earth is the big transformation transformer and you can even say the formula of tara tora rota and then it will even work better on your hair i believe so that's what i do <laughs> yes i just wanted to ask can we put hair and nails in compost where, where i live we have compost collection 
um, rather than gardens. So is this the same as putting it in the garden? I presume so. I presume so because within this process uh, of all these, these little beings that live in the compost heap, it is transformed and made into earth. So I can imagine that that would be fine. The reference to what the master said about hair, what I remember is he said, but to be checked, but that's my memory to burn the hair uh, during wax waning moon and to use it as a ceremony to sacrifice and to um, let go some vices. Okay. So that's my recollection. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that was such a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. I know many dowsers who clear space and I've used some of these people myself as I've entered different rentals and they have a variety of methods and one man in particular Joey Korn has a whole book on blessings and he blesses spaces and I thought one thing that's quite unusual about his work is that he has discovered a bed pattern and he discovered that it was the separate tree the, the tree of life in the Hebrew tradition, as the master so often refers to, and that this bed pattern, all the parts are there. Um, and I've been meaning to mention the teachings of the master to him to see if there's any, he has any um, connection that way. But I thought that's quite interesting that he's found a bed pattern that reflects that. Just wanted to yeah. add that piece. That's interesting. I, 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 I don't it. know about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I didn't know if you had any more specifics to say about beds in particular. <laughs> that made me think of that. You know, I think uh, it's a little bit what I said about Feng Shui, that we have really got a possibility to do so much, to transform so much. We've got all these invisible beings that can help us. And we, we've had, we have a wonderful teacher in the master that tells us how to change things. And I think that very often we spend a lot of money on things, uh, you know, that we believe will make our life easier, that we will dream better in this bed, that we will uh, we'll be able to meditate better if we're under this. And I think that is up to us to really create the spaces that we need. I think that this is within the possibility of each and every one of us. If we really live with the question and we ask for the inspiration to do the right thing. You know, I said that nature doesn't tolerate a void because it will always be filled with something. Now, spirit doesn't tolerate fullness revelation presupposes emptiness put at its disposal if we want to receive a revelation we have to make our minds empty we have to really create a space so that we can have this and i believe that if we sincerely live with questions and this is what i mentioned earlier on to me when i have something that i really want to know i consciously try to create something that is to me like a chalice, you know, like the Holy Grail or whatever. And I ask the question and until I have my answers, and I think if we then are awake at some point, there will be an answer that comes, it will be filled and then we can use that. So I think that uh, we should learn to trust also our inner being and, and that we can be guided 
towards doing the right thing. There are so many things out there, really so many things. And of course, I have, as I said, been around the world and I have seen so many people who want to sell you things because you're going to be better in this, you're going to be better in that. What the master taught us about the colors and the forms and the, the archetypes and all things, we have got basically all this knowledge. We just have to learn to, to trust it and to apply it really with humility and also with trust. Linda, thank you so much. It's been a really wonderful, very rich uh, time with you. you. You've brought so many threads uh, to the central theme of cleaning and the, and the spiritual life. So, so we, we thank you. And thank you to all the participants who are present and also all the wonderful questions and comments. And uh, we hope to see you all uh, at the next Circle of Light and also the Zoom after our meeting with Linda Slovenia. So have a wonderful day or evening week, whatever. Take care. And a huge, huge thank you to Linda for uh, your wonderful presentation, your stimulation, your encouragement, and for us to apply this part of the, the art of cleaning with meaning. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Si la giva risonna per giusta, se la giva risonna per giusta, se la giva risonna per giusta.